Agora TV. The world is thinking. But that isn't the whole story. What Wallace was interested in, and what I think we need to know more about, is the legacy of the evolutionary process. Because if you look about you, you can see that legacy. We live in a civilization embedded in a global ecosystem where cooperation is the way things work. Our own bodies tell us that. You know, the, the little mitochondria that live in our cells that give us our energy, they're not really part of us. They came to live in our cells a billion or more years ago. And the union now between the cells that are us and those bacteria, those ancient free living bacteria that became our mitochondria, is now so complete that it was only a decade or two ago that scientists realised they had separate origins. And you see that all around the world. Ecosystems are all about collaboration and cooperation. That's the legacy of evolution. And legacies endure far longer often than the motive force that sets them in train. So it's important we understand that, that sure, the mechanism is pretty nasty and brutish. The legacy, the thing it gives rise to is an enormously cooperative world. Evolution, in short, is on our side when it comes to starting to live cooperatively in the planet that we are very necessarily part of. And if you look at what's happened to us in the longer time view, and I'm a paleontologist, I love long time views, I hate short time views, things. Take the long time view, you start seeing some interesting things. Just think about what's happened to us in 10,000 years. We started off as hunter-gatherers that lived pretty much the same as lions live or hyenas live in small family groups, hunting big prey 10,000 years ago, and look at us today. We're part of a global civilization. And what's that process actually done for us? Well, in a way, it's created an unprecedentedly powerful entity on the planet, which is our global civilization, but at the cost of weakening our competency as individuals. If you took me or anyone in this room and put us back on the African savanna of 10,000 years ago, we'd probably only last a couple of days at most, because we, no one can make their own shelters anymore or their own tools or hunt their own food or anything else. We've given up all of that autonomy to become part of an immensely powerful whole. And that's played out through history. I mean, when the first Europeans came to this country in 1788 and met the Aboriginal people, you know, the Jagger Jagger brothers that signed Batman's lease in Melbourne, they were six foot two, six foot two, and six foot four. Big, powerful, immensely competent men. And yet who won out? It was the weedy, poxed, um, sickly convicts. And only because they were part of a very powerful superorganism a very powerful entity. They themselves were weak compared with the Aboriginal people, but they were part of a very powerful whole. We've come a long way in that 10,000 years. Um, our civilization has self-organized itself. No one, in, no one designed this civilization. We invented it without the use of reason. Evolution shaped it to be what it is. And we've overcome immense difficulties, uh, many of them dealing with pollution. You know, in the 19th century, uh, London was ankle deep in sewerage, basically. Um, and it was a cause of many diseases, such as cholera. Now, at that time, the germ theory of disease transmission was really new and hardly anyone believed it. And yet people still knew they had to clean up London. And, um, and so people didn't. And incidentally, it wasn't the people who were dying of cholera that paid for the cleanup. It was the wealthy burghers of London that necessarily had to pay for the cleanup. So we have got a history of um, combating um, environmental problems, uh, problems rather similar in some ways to the climate problem, not entirely similar, but in some ways similar. And I think that should give us heart that we do have the capacity to overcome these problems.